they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken uh, 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 to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, beloved, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us that you should be uh, 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 for, for salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified uh, the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life uh, believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up uh, the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas uh, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. Verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. May God bless the reading of his word. Wanting more tonight. So I want to consider with you firstly the necessity of preaching. Because our text is actually a response to what had been preached in the synagogue that morning. And we see people responding. And so the necessity of preaching tonight, the need to preach the word of God should never be underestimated. It is never to be neglected. It should never be sidelined. Why? Because God has ordained preaching to be the means through which humanity can hear of him, uh, that is God, through which humanity can hear of God's plans for them, uh, through which humanity can hear of God's future for them, hear of his will for them, hear of his demands for living a righteous life, but more so hear of his love and consequently that humanity can turn to God. It is designed that preaching of the word of God is the means through which men's hearts and women's hearts can turn to God. You and I tonight, uh, in the absence of the preaching of the word of God, our lives are doomed. You and I tonight, in the absence of the audible declaration of the word of God, our lives are left to destruction. Romans chapter 10 verse 14, the Bible will tell us, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how then shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So here is the right of Romans making this point a clear this evening that it is the preaching of the word of God that causes men and women to hear what God has for them and as they hear there is a hope that they'll be able to respond to the call of God and the Bible says they will in turn be able to believe that is why contained in preaching is sometimes things that we may not be comfortable with but they are needful can somebody say amen I have sat in sermons as a young man, as a, as a disciple here in this church. I sat in hard sermons by Pastor Bowman. I mean, sermons that are uh, that, uh, 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 so hard that, that you're wishing, uh, you're wishing uh, rapture can come and hopefully you're, you, you're gone. Uh, I've sat under hard sermons by Pastor Day, sat under hard sermons by Pastor George. But listen to me tonight, uh, 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 the preaching of the word of God sometimes uh, comes with uncomfortable but needful things. This discomfort sometimes is uh, to the preacher. As preachers, we do not enjoy uh, being confrontational. Some of us uh, have, uh, have this mark that, uh, that uh, we preach uh, hard sermons. Uh, 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 but, but listen to me tonight. Uh, there is no joy in confronting issues, uh, but it must be done in as much as it is uncomfortable for the preacher. Listen to me. Uh, uh, preaching contains a confronting of sin. Uh, uh, 
uh, the book uh, uh, of this book rather the Bible is filled with names of preachers who were hated for preaching the truth uh, John the Baptist you know your Bible he confronted Herod for taking his brother's wife he said you could be the king and you are the king you could have the money and you have the money you can afford another wife but God forbid for you O Herod to take your brother's wife that is wrong he stood up against the highest man in the land and preached an uncompromising gospel to him confronted the sin that King Herod was living in and you know your Bible it costed John the Baptist his neck he died he was he was beheaded because of preaching an uncompromising gospel to the sins of the leader of that nation our Lord Jesus Christ himself he preached on righteousness he preached on uh, uh, these uh, religious establishment the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, he preached against them uh, that they were whitewashed tombs uh, on the outside they look all beautiful but inside they are dead man's bones and when he preached that gospel when he preached that message he did not sit well with the religious establishment the Bible would tell us that many times they plotted to kill our Lord Jesus Christ but it was not the time and he would easily disappear and you know your Bible they crucified him on a cross why because he confronted their sin Paul the apostle was uh, uh, many times uh, 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 rejected Peter in this in the town they were pushed uh, 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 persecuted for preaching the gospel Paul would write to a young preacher by the name of Timothy who would no doubt had faced the resistance and intimidation from his congregation can you imagine tonight facing resistance and intimidation not from the sinners out there but inside the church right where he was pastoring and as he's facing this no doubt he was contemplating backing down he was contemplating turning down and the Bible would tell us that Paul his spiritual father would write to young Timothy second Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 preach the word that those were his words to young Timothy he says listen Timothy I know uh, you are facing resistance I know you are facing backlash I know you are facing intimidation against uh, what you are preaching but listen to me you need to stand your ground and preach the word be ready in season and out of season convince rebuke exhort with all long suffering and teaching and young Timothy was given this charge to preach the word the message is the love of God for humanity the method is through the preaching of the word of God Titus chapter 1 verse 3 the Bible says but has in due time manifested his word through preaching which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior so here is Titus he's showing us tonight in this text that the eventual benefit of the declared word he says that God's word for him was manifested meaning it was made known to him in due time as he sat under the preaching of the word of God as he heard a, a, a service after service at the preaching of the word of God he came to a conclusion he says in due time uh, uh, God manifested his word through preaching as I hear the preaching of the word of God the word that God has for me manifested it came forth it became visible but that only happened when we give our ears and when we give ourselves to the preaching of the word of God the more we give ourselves uh, the more we sit under the preaching of his word the more his will for our lives is manifested the more we expose ourselves to the preaching of the word of God it does us all the good listen to me tonight there are things that are in me not because I studied not because I read but because I sat and as I sat there was a man behind the sacred desk and as he preached as he declared Declared, those nuggets of truth that began to, uh, to, 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 became, to become resident within me uh, in the process of time uh, and uh, I've bought into those our text shows us uh, the heart of men and women uh, who are hungering for more of the word of God uh, verse 42 the Bible says so when the Jews went out of the synagogue the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath can you believe it tonight you come to church Sunday morning and as you are leaving you are begging pastor says pastor we want a repeat of this sermon Have you ever felt like that 
We want a repeat of this sermon. What we have heard has brought an encouragement. Please, as we come next Sunday, as we come on Wednesday, we want you to repeat these words. Listen to me tonight. That's a heart of a man or a woman that wants more of God and less of this world. More of the will of God upon their lives and less of this world. Listen to verse 43. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who was speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Followed the preachers and said, listen, you guys, there is a grace upon your life. This word, grace, is a profound word. They began to beg, the Bible would tell us. Preach this next Sabbath. Come back again, signifying that there was a hunger for the genuine word of God. And the Bible would tell us that the following Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. And so when they left service, they went home and said, listen, you people, you missed a good sermon. But guess what? We told the preacher to repeat the sermon. So come next Sabbath. We will sit under the same preaching, even today, tonight, where the media portrays a dislike for the word of God. There are still people who are hungering for the genuine, the simple, undiluted word from heaven. I cannot tell you how many times, whenever I do a revival, many people come and they are saying, ah, it just ended so soon. Whenever we're doing a crusade, people coming, expressing a desire to continue on. Last year, I was doing a crusade in Chazanga for Pastor Kumbus and his wife are there. And so we planned only for two nights, a Friday and Saturday. But on the Saturday, as we, uh, uh, Friday and Saturday, and those Saturdays we were there, uh, people came and, 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 and they were disappointed that it was the last day. Uh, 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 but, but we changed. We said, listen, let's do it one more night. We, we, we changed just right there. After the, after, the, after the crusade, we announced, we said, listen, tomorrow, Sunday night, we are here again. And even after the third night, people still came and saying, listen, you people are going back. No need to go back. Extend. There is a hunger for the word of God tonight. Paul and Barnabas, we are urged to continue in this grace. Like I've mentioned, grace is a rich word. It's a rich theological word defined as divine enabling. And so here you see tonight a uh, 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 meaning God was, is working in mere men and women, causing them to do things which otherwise they are unable to do. That's what divine enabling means. And the people were able to notice that these men, yes, they are preaching, but they are not just preaching out of intellect. They are not just preaching out of a theological background. They are not just preaching from experience. There is a hand of God upon their lives. There is a grace. There is an enabling of God upon their lives. And these onlookers would say, listen, you ought to continue in this grace. I mean, oh, we need to hear those words. They were able to see this supernatural ebbling at work in their lives and they encouraged them to continue on. Let me then consider, secondly, a double-edged sword. A double-edged sword. The Word of God has been described as being sharper than a double-edged sword. Hebrews 4 verse 12. The Bible says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So that's, that's a loaded scripture there. It's a loaded scripture there says the word of God is living this is not history book this is alive 
It has the power to change a life. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Notice what it, what it does. The Bible says it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit. I, I, I don't even understand myself yet. The, 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 the soul and spirit union coming into, into man. But, but here the Bible says the word of God has the capability to divide between the soul and the spirit and the joints and marrow. Uh, but, but more interestingly, it says it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The preached word is so powerful that it finds people right where they are. It finds people right where they are. It doesn't matter the crowd. It doesn't matter the demographics of the crowd. It doesn't matter the intellectual levels of the crowd. This book tonight, when it is declared, the Bible says, it finds people right where they are. You can have a millionaire seated in church or wherever, and one who only has a name to his name, a rage rather to his name. But the Bible would tell us here that it meets people right where they are. That's how powerful the Word of God is. I have preached to people that I have no clue their background, and they would come to me and say, it's as if you, are, it's as if you know what I'm going through. What you say is exactly what I'm dealing with. Why? Because the priest word finds people right where they are. The Bible says it is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Oh, beloved, that's the hope that is found in preaching, that the words of the preacher can carry an anointing to be able to reach people, to be able to help people, to be able to bring a hope, to be able to restore. Why? Because of the love of God for his people. Since it's a discerner of the hearts of men and women. Listen to the testimony of David as he lived his life, and we thank God that he was able to write most of the things that he experienced. Psalms 119 verse 28, it says, My soul melts from heaviness. But where does he find the answer? The answer is found, strengthen me according to your word. Here he is. He, saw, he says, as I go through life's struggles, my soul is melting with the heaviness. But I'm not just left like that, I'm melting away. There is a strength that comes to me by your word. There's a reviving that comes. When we are exposed to the preaching of the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 25. My soul clings to dust. Revive me according to your word. Again here we see that there's a reviving. There's a bringing back to life. When our souls are exposed to the preaching of the word of God. There are people here tonight. Your souls are weary. You're struggling. Hopelessness is settling in. But listen to me tonight. As you expose yourself to the preaching of the word of God, the Bible says there is a reviving of the spirit that will come upon your life. Why? Because God knows exactly where you are at and the preaching of the word of God, it meets people right where they are. Psalms 119 verse 38, establish your word to your servant. Who is devoted to fearing you? And so again we see here that when we expose ourselves to the preaching of the word of God, there's an establishing that comes. We begin to grow roots. That's what establishing means. You become stable. You become strong. 
You become uh, uh, flourished. You become nourished as a child of God. Why? Because you're exposing yourself to the preaching of the Word of God. Again, I cannot tell you the benefits that I have personally enjoyed by simply coming uh, to this church uh, the many years that I was here as a disciple exposing myself to sound uh, preaching uh, just by being seated uh, taking notes uh, sometimes of things that I don't even understand uh, but in the process of time uh, there came an establishing roots uh, began to develop uh, began to be nourished uh, began to be stable why because of the preaching of the Word of God and David says you establish me as I hear your word. Psalms 119 verse 50. This is my comfort in my affliction. For your word has given me life. In times of affliction. In times of a loss. In times of a death. In times of a disappointment. David says, my comfort in those times is in your word because your word gives me life. I could have lost, but when I came to your house, heard the preaching of your word, there was something that was added to me. It brought a life. It means in times of affliction, and boy, are they many. He says, we find comfort in the preaching of the word of God. Psalms 119 verse 34. Those who fear you will be glad when they see you because I have hoped in your word. There's hope to face our tomorrows. That hope is revived when we sit under the preaching of the word of God. Psalms 119 verse 103. How sweet are your words to my test. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Why? Because in preaching, God who knows our hearts who knows the condition of our hearts. He seeks to help us and he reaches down to the very place where we are at. And he has ordained the preaching of the word of God to be able to do that for you and I. The testimony of Pastor Paul Stevens is a leader in our fellowship, in the Opaso Church. Pastor Paul Stevens got saved. But the one who got saved first was his wife. They were just early 20s. His wife got saved in a midweek service. As he got saved, as, as she got saved rather, she came home, told her husband, I'm no longer going to be participating in drinking and all that. And, 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 and she invited the husband to a church service the following Sunday morning where Pastor Harold Warner was preaching. And so they sat in that church, Pastor Harold Warner is preaching, and according to his testimony, he says, it's like he was reading my life at that particular time. His sermon was just about the way I was living my life, wasting my life. Turned to his wife, did you tell that man something about me? The woman said, nothing. At the end of the sermon, Pastor... Paul Stevens then just came to the altar, repented of his sins. Why? Because the preaching of the word of God found him right where he was. Listen to me tonight. God knows you. He cares about you. Again, I cannot tell you how many times people have come to me after preaching and says, Pastor, that is exactly what I'm going through. Thank you for preaching that word. Now, whether it comes or it doesn't come, me, I'll continue preaching. <laughs> I'm not one of those that need that for me to preach the next sermon. No, 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 no. <laughs> but when it comes, we embrace it. And so that was happening in the church or in the synagogue, but we see also that in the midst of that revival happening, opposition came. Preaching that is heaven ordained is preaching that will be opposed. If you don't want opposition, future pastors here, 
If you don't want opposition, just preach easygoing sermons. Just preach about God blessing more money. Just preach. Don't preach. Don't preach the Bible. <laughs> because if you preach the Bible, you'll be opposed. Verse 45 of our text. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They were filled with a lot of things. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Opposition comes because this kind of preaching yields results. The Bible begins by saying, when the Jews saw the multitudes that were following Paul and Barnabas, results. When they saw that this kind of preaching is what people really needed, when they saw that this kind of preaching was able to yield results, people were turning away from their sin and repenting of their sins. When the Jews, the religious establishment, saw that, the Bible says, they began to oppose. Multitudes were attracted to Paul and Barnabas' preaching. And so let's consider the nature of opposition. The Bible says, envy filled their hearts. Envy is defined as a feeling of discontentment or being resentful. This is aroused by someone else's success. <laughs> this is what envy does. I want what you have, but I'm not willing to pay the price for me to have what you have. And so because I cannot have it, I also don't want you to have it. That's envy. You are discontented. You are resenting somebody's success. And in our text, the success was simply... In preaching. In preaching. In preaching. <laughs> A thing which they could have also said, mm, something, How is it that their preaching is yielding results and ours is not yielding results? I mean, that's the answer to envy. Just go to the person you are envious of and say, Moana, how are you doing it? Perhaps we can learn a few things. But no. Bible says, they began to oppose. They began to contradict what they were preaching. They began to speak ill, blasphemy. Envy tonight is wickedness at its core. They began to fight what God was doing. Since I cannot have what you have, I will fight it. I will fight you. I will not let you have what you are having. Let me close then lastly and look at fulfilling your purpose. Fulfilling your purpose. Because like I've mentioned, our text is a reaction to what Paul and Barnabas had preached. Fulfilling your purpose. Came across a very interesting story of an evangelist. He calls himself as an evangelist by the name of Nicholas James. This man he was born without hands or, limb, or legs. At the age of, I believe, 12, he gave his life to Jesus. He surrendered his heart. He doesn't have hands, he doesn't have legs. And so he, he, he just moves by, by us. And so, he, to cut the long story short, he turned his disability to the glory of God. He said the following, he said, if I will not receive a miracle of hands and legs, 
I will be a miracle to somebody else. So what he meant by that was, if God will not give me hands, I'm praying for that, I'm believing God for that, but if he will not give me hands, he actually says, I even have shoes in my closet because I know God may give me legs. But if he doesn't give me legs, I will be a miracle to somebody else, meaning I will not allow this disability to make me gloomy. I would rather be joyous. I would rather preach the word of God and demonstrate to people the love of God that, that he can use me to further his kingdom. Tonight, you must fulfill your purpose. Some of you are saying, yes, pastor, I'm on that path. I'm, I'm making actually double what I was making last year. I'm fulfilling my purpose. <laughs> you must fulfill why God created you. Also in our text, Paul, in response to the opposition, the Bible says, he grew bored and declared to them what God had initially mandated him to do. It's amazing to me to see how the enemy, or rather what the enemy uses for evil, God begins to turn it around and actually causes that to be our fulfilling of our purpose. What the enemy means for evil, God actually turns it around and causes us to be able to fulfill our purpose in the midst of the frustration. So we see in our text, there was opposition, there was frustration, but we need to understand that fr frustrations can actually make us to venture into what God has already ordained for us to do and to be. It was Joseph who first coined these words. Genesis 50 verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. He pause here tonight. You as a human being, you need to be able to identify frustrations of life, oppositions of life. In the midst of those frustrations and oppositions, you should be man enough, you should be woman enough to be able to see the bigger picture. Joseph was able to identify it. I mean, you know your Bible. He was thrown in the pit, left for dead, until one of his brothers says, ah, we can make some coins out of this guy. Sold him to some passers-by. He spends a life away from parents as a young boy, away from family. He's all by himself in a foreign land. He's accused of sleeping with the big boss's wife. He's sent into prison. He spends years in prison. He's forgotten by people that he had helped in the process of time. In, 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 in a turn of events, the Bible says, Pharaoh, the highest man in the land, makes him the second in command. Only answerable to Pharaoh, things have changed. And now the tables have turned. His brothers have, are now coming to Egypt because Egypt has been saved. Or rather, the whole world has been saved then because of Joseph's brains and Joseph's hand of God upon his life. And now he's on the other side of the table. His brothers have come. He reveals himself to them. They're scared. They're frightened. Is he going to kill us? And he speaks these words. He says, you meant it evil against me. But because my heart is large enough, I am able to see that the hand of God was behind it so that our people can be saved alive. See, beloved, we need to be able to see God in times of opposition. You need to be able to see God in times of resistance. 
You need to be able to see God in times of delays. When one door closes, God, when you are able to see him, he is able to open several doors for his children. Paul says in our text, He says, I have a mission. I have a purpose that God has placed upon my life. And that purpose is to be a missionary to the Gentiles. And he says, God has a way of using unpleasant circumstances to further his plans. You know your Bible, the very inception of the church, in the book of Acts, the believers faced persecution, spread all over the country, but God was at the center of the persecution. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 8, rather, verse 1 and 4. Now Saul was consenting to his death at that time. A great persecution arose against the church which was in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. This has been the strategy of God from time immemorial. He is never lost for answers. Nothing catches him by surprise. He is the all-knowing God. He uses persecution to spread the word. Too much comfort can sometimes make us forget our God-given mandate. Too much comfort. He uses persecution to spread the word. In our text, verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. So here is Paul. His mind is on another level because his life has been captured by God. There's a purpose for his life. And he says, you have rejected, you are chasing us, you have rejected the gospel. He says, we are now turning to the Gentiles. Verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be uh, for salvation to the ends of the earth. And so Paul knew who he was. He was not moved by what the religious establishment were doing. He knew his calling. He knew his purpose at the time of his conversion. The Bible will tell us that God revealed his purpose uh, 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 to Paul when he got saved. Acts chapter 9 verse 15. But the Lord said to him, speaking to Ananias, he says, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, speaking about Paul, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So here is God. Paul had just gotten saved a few days uh, uh, when, that, when those words were spoken. God speaks to Ananias to go and lay his hands on Paul. And the Bible says Ananias knows who so is. He's a persecutor of the church. He's afraid of him. And God comforts Ananias. He says, listen, I have chosen him. I have chosen him. He's my vessel to bear my name. But the, 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 the mandate of Saul or Paul is for him to bear my name to the Gentiles. At conversion, his mission was to reach the unreached. At conversion, his mission was to reach not his people, but beyond his people. Romans 11 verse 13, he would speak. He says, for I speak to you Gentiles. In as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. He even called himself as an apostle to the Gentiles. And so let's back up tonight as I close here. Opposition is happening. There is persecution. They are chasing Paul and Barnabas out of the city. They don't want to see them. And Paul says, <laughs> you are actually helping me do what God called me to do. But <laughs> You can't. You are actually helping me do what God has called me to do. And so I'm heading to the Gentiles. The resultant effect of this was... Verse 48, I close. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. Just, just, just for, just for uh, clarity, say, Gentiles are you and me. <laughs> and as many as had been appointed to eternal life, they believed. Verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. 
So we see here that purpose was fulfilled in the midst of opposition. I don't know what you're going through tonight. But I want you to look around. Not here. As you're going through whatever you're going through in your life, look around. Could this opposition be a turning point for something new? Could this struggle, this which I'm going through, be a turning point for something different? I want you to bow your head tonight in respect to God and the person that is seated next to you. Thank God for you. I appreciate God for you tonight. Before we do anything else tonight in our ministry, maybe you are here, you are not saved, you are not born again. You are not right with God. Your sins are not forgiven. Thank you for coming. But tonight, you're not right with God. I want to give you an opportunity to surrender your heart to Jesus. He loves you. He cares for you. That's you tonight. You may not have understood everything tonight that I've preached, but one thing you know, you are not saved. You're not born again. And you want to surrender your heart to Jesus. I want you to lift up your hand. I'll pray with you tonight at this altar. Hallelujah. Anyone tonight, honest before God, you're saying, yes, I am not saved, I'm not born again, but tonight, I want to trust God. Lift up your hand, I'll pray with you tonight. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. This is to help you and I tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to change the order of the service. Speaking to Christians tonight, I want to open these altars for us to come and find a place to pray. Lay hold of God tonight and ask him to help you to realize, to see that in the midst of opposition, whatever it is that you're going through, God is making a way out. These altars are open as we rise to our feet tonight. Let's come and find a place to pray before him tonight. Hallelujah, as we sing a song in the presence of Almighty God. Father, we need you tonight. Oh God, we covet your presence. We desire your help tonight in Jesus' name. Oh God, we are desperate tonight. God, we need you. Oh, Rico, ro, ro, bo, bo, si, All I have God, help us to see God me. in the name of Jesus, to fulfill I God's calling, to fulfill many God's purpose in the name of Jesus, in the midst of opposition, God. That we bless your name. Oh, Rico, ro, ro, ri, be, be, si, you. Is in you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you, our Lord. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have God, your have way, way in me. This, this is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship. And 
so grateful to you tonight for your word how we pray God that you'd help us oh God fulfill oh God that purpose that you have for us oh God even in this life we pray God that indeed your word father we shall carry with us in the name of Jesus tonight as we depart one from another God we pray that you'd grant us traveling mercies oh Lord help us in Jesus name we pray amen amen may God richly bless you tonight 